Hello, I'm Grant, and welcome to Second Plate, a cooking show that focuses on reusing ingredients and making use of things that you already have around your house. So today I wanted to splurge a little bit and I wanted to make steak. But we're going to actually make this steak sous vide, which means we're going to seal it, seal it in a plastic bag and then we're going to use this device that keeps the water at a very specific temperature and then that's how we're going to get the exact steak we want so it comes out a really nice consistent way each time. In addition to that, for my side, I wanted to do some simple potatoes. It was a recipe that I wanted to have alongside the steak because it's just kind of neat. What I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be sectioning these off to make little potato cubes. We're going to boil them to soften them up. Then we're going to toss them with some oil and some buttermilk. And then that gives you this nice creamy soft layer that we're then going to bake. So you get a crisp outside, like, kind of like french fry, but you still have a nice soft inner center. It's pretty great and it goes really well with T-bone steak. So again, I'm Grant. This is Second Plate and let's get cooking. What we're going to start off with is seasoning the steak. Usually this is something I would do actually ahead of time. You could do this a full day in advance because of how sous vide works. But I'm just going to be seasoning this with salt, pepper, salt, and try to be fairly generous because there is a lot of steak here. Larger than I normally buy, but Figured, why not? I went to an actual butcher shop for this as well. That's why I was trying to make, a, make sure I got a nice good one, get some advice, see what they recommended. Just adding some garlic powder. And then in addition to this, I'm going to be adding a couple other things in the bag itself. I have rosemary and garlic. The rosemary is not going to actually be eaten. But what we're going to do is I'll place it in the bag, as well as at the end of the show, when after it's done, we're going to sear it and we're going to put that in the pan with the butter. And it just kind of helps add a little bit more flavor. It's a aromatic, as it's called. Cool. This is pretty generous. We have our nice seasoning. I'm going to go grab this bag. So what's interesting about this is many things. The reason I like this is sous vide is very consistent and it's very easy to slowly find out exactly what you want. You can't really burn anything with sous vide because unless you set the temperature to be incredibly high, which it's not, this is about 140, it's always going to come out very similar. So like if I put this in and say it goes in fine and I'm like, that's good, but it was a little bit too well done, then I must would just know that, you know what, next time I make it, I'm going to put this in to 138. And you can get that nice doneness that you actually want. Cool. I'm just putting this in here so it's watertight. And we're going to let this soak. So again, the way this actually works is I'm setting this water to be the temperature I want my steak to be at when it's done. So I want about medium well. Usually I'll go a little bit rarer, but I want to make sure like get a good consistency because uh, it can vary depending on where you're cooking it, just the temperature of the room and stuff. But what it's going to actually kind of come out with is it's going to be very juicy, it's going to be very red, and we're going to make a nice sear on the outside that's going to kind of hold all that in until you actually cut into it. It's something where I think this looks super spooky if you've never seen this done before because you're like, what's going on there? But really, it all works out and it's so much more consistent. Like This looks like a lot, but I can't describe how it's almost easier because like this is something where I'll like the night before, say if I'm going to do like a 24 hour marinade, you just prep the steaks entirely before, put them in their marinade. When it's time, you just say have this going. It's pretty safe because it's like essentially a nearly sealed unit. I can just put this on my countertop, which means I already save on kitchen space because like I can put this on my kitchen table to get, get some extra space. It's just a nice thing. But I really like this. You don't have to use just steak for this. I've also done it with chicken. You just set it up at a higher temperature, obviously, like 165 to make sure everything's good. You can do it with fish. You can do it with things like ground beef. It's not the most ideal thing, but really it's very creative and you can just put so much. Like I, on just like last Saturday when I was doing tests for this recipe, I got five like of these large T-bone steaks and I just did it in this container. And that really easily shows how consistent it is, whereas normally if you had to cook five steaks individually, they would just range where it's like, okay, some are getting overdone because you have to like micromanage so much, or maybe other ones just stayed on too long. But this is a nice way to get overall very consistent use and uh, 
I'm a very consistent cook on all of your steaks. And I, it's something where I'm hoping just like for me, having it like over years and years of doing this more and more, I can really dial in the exact steak that I want. So we're gonna move on next to our potatoes. I just have four, but you can use as many as you need for your people. Just going to cut these up into chunks. The idea here is we're essentially going to be cooking these twice. And I know I asked the question when I first started making this, why is that necessary? Because technically, once these are out of the water, they are cooked. You could eat them. They are done. They are all fully tender. But the goal of cooking them a second time is to get a very soft potato on the inside, but have the outside be almost fried, more like a, uh, a french fry. So you get like this crispiness. And the way you do that is by tossing it in oil. Because the potatoes are soft, they'll kind of absorb the oil as well as make this little outside layer. And that outside layer of seasoning and soft potato and oil, that's going to essentially fry, more or less, inside the oven. And it also just, it adds a certain amount of prestige, I think, to it, to have that. Like, it's something where, this is the kind of recipe I would pull out if I want to have potatoes for something fancy, like, like with a steak, you know? Like, if I'm just doing this at home on like a Wednesday night, I probably wouldn't go the extra step to boil and then bake them separately. But if I'm gonna go, you know, break everything else out for like, say, the sous vide, and I'm having people over, then I really like having this extra step because it does add a certain amount of quality to the dish. And it, it makes them look great. Whereas if you have just normal like boiled potatoes or like wedged and stuff, they just look kind of bland. But when you get that really nice outside layer, I, I really like that and it goes alongside the steak really well because it has like kind of the same colors. And then I don't have this here, but the next staple of a meal like this would be some kind of very green meal. Like my go-to is like asparagus. Or if I had to try something else, I would do Brussels sprouts, which is something that I think is also kind of scary that it's going to be terrible, but if you could do it just right, I think that would go perfect with steak. And you can bake those alongside the potatoes if you need to. Jeff, it's going through, section these off. I will also be adding some Parmesan cheese after the boiling, obviously, to just kind of add some extra flavor. It melts really nice in the oven while they cook and just add something to it. You could obviously omit it, but if I'm having steak and potatoes, I'm not doing a very uh, carb conscious meal anyway. So you know why not just throw in those extra calories to liven up the potatoes. Just One thing is, you'll notice I don't actually peel these potatoes. You can. It's optional. I do for some of the recipes. Like if I obviously am going to mash potatoes, I would peel them. But for this, I kind of like getting the, I'm not sure if it's literally a rind, but the outside skin of the potato. I think, again, it helps with like the color. As long as you like wash your potatoes and stuff, it will be fine. But if you want to go ahead and do that beforehand, that's okay. It will affect that one side of the potato, how they fry in the oven, because essentially that's kind of a non-soft side. But that's fine, because you'll still get a fair bit of the potato paste, as it will be, on the outside, so it will work. And that way you get that, again, like the outside skin, like when this fries and you get that really dark color on it, that's, that, it's a good potato. So like that's what I'm looking for, is like I want this to come out really dark compared to the rest. It gives just some good contrast. Here I have some water I'm boiling. I'm just gonna add these potatoes to it. Careful not to splash too much. But at this stage, really I am trying to just soften the potatoes for their next step. I'm just gonna put these in here and then I'm gonna actually prepare this bowl. So what we wanna add to the potatoes is gonna be a couple things. Obviously salt, pepper. The main thing is oil, so I have just some olive oil. And the idea is we are going to combine all the cooked potatoes in here, and I'm just gonna take a spatula and just constantly kind of just agitate them. Just like make them like hit each other, break apart a little bit, and pick up this paste, as well as that's when we're gonna season. 
as well as adding some buttermilk, just add a little bit more flavor. And then we're gonna put it all in tray and then we're gonna pop it into the oven about like 350-ish. After about 10 minutes that they've been here, I'm going to just kind of keep pulling a couple out occasionally. I just have a slotted spoon. And I just try to check them with a fork. And I'm mainly looking to see that they're soft and like kind of tender all the way through. So see how they like kind of just cut right through and then you can like mash them like that. That's what I'm looking for because that's the basis of what I want to happen in this bowl. So I'm going to start pulling them all out and add them to my bowl. Obviously an easy way to get this would just be to strain it, but however you want to do it. So I think that's good enough. Once we have all the potatoes out, I'm gonna go ahead and just bring it over here. I'm gonna add some olive oil. I need enough that it can coat all these potatoes, but it doesn't hurt too much if you use more or less. You just kinda of have to feel it. I'll probably add a little bit more. Then I'm just adding some buttermilk. Again, I don't have any real proportions on this because it just, it depends on how rich you want your potatoes. It depends on like, do you, like how many potatoes you have. But I'm just going to go and get it fairly well around, add some salt, add some pepper, any other spices you might want to add. You can also do this after, say after you bake it or once it's ready there, but it just seems to, seems to me that like, hey, I'm sitting mixing this all up anyway, why not just do it now? So I'm gonna continue turning the potatoes and what you end up getting is this paste that begins to form like right on here and such, basically as the potatoes mash into each other and that paste is going to form this kind of oil layer and also it just makes it kind of look cool. Like it was, I feel like if you have perfectly cubed potatoes, it feels a little bit too industrial or clean. Whereas this makes them look like a lot more homemade and it really does put them somewhere in between a slightly mashed potato, a baked potato and a french fry that makes this kind of interesting. So whenever you feel satisfied, then what I'm gonna do is just transfer it to a pan for baking. I have it just right here. Spray this down with some non-stick spray. And then just dish them up into this. Okay. Again, since the whole point was them to form this paste, you don't have to feel like you need to be delicate. I will then make a point though to spread these out just because you, I want as much air contact as possible so that they do fry. So you, if you get them all together, it will work, but you're probably gonna end up with chunks that are a lot more like a baked potato than individual chunks of potato that are fried. Which, if that's what you prefer, go for it. It's entirely your call. Here I have some just Parmesan cheese you can use other cheeses if you want, but I like the hard cheese because when it melts, you can still see that it's there. Plus, it makes them stay together very well. It acts kind of like threads holding the potatoes together. When you actually go to eat it, you'll definitely notice them. Some more pepper and definitely some more salt. And then we're gonna go put these in. This is set to 350. And this is another one where, at this point, the potatoes are done, right? We boiled them, they're all perfectly fine. So really, I am just looking to see, are they reaching the level of doneness that I want? So again, I have this at 350, but one thing I will vary is I'll 
instead sometimes use the uh, broiler to really cook the tops and then just instead rotate it. Because depending on what I'm going for and how they're cooking, sometimes you want that really quick, cooked, crisp outer layer, and that's an easy way to achieve that. So that's just something that's kind of like in your repertoire. But I'll just keep an eye on that as I quickly cook my steak. And then generally, since the steak itself is pretty much done, I wait for this to be entirely done, and then I will do the steak, because the steak takes probably about two minutes, and we're gonna go do that right now. So, just going to wipe off some of this water. I'm gonna heat up my pan. I personally, I usually use a cast iron skillet for this. You want it to be a very high temperature, because what we're gonna be doing is we are going to be searing the steak. And what that is, is when you cook steak sous vide, it's really juicy. Now, you want all that to kind of stay together. So essentially, we're going to be very quickly cooking the outermost layer on a high heat, as well as using some butter and basting and like rosemary and all that. So it's a nice, almost like a shell. It's not gonna be crispy or like really hard, but it's going to kind of hold all that in. Alternately, one thing I do want to mention is, what's nice with sous vide steak is there isn't really a need to rest the steak. Like if you cook it, say, in the oven or on the grill top, you want to let it just sit for 10 minutes to kind of redistribute some of the flavor. That's, or rather the juice, that's not necessary with sous vide, but it also won't hurt it. I just have some butter here. Get a fair bit. I'm just going to add that to my pan. Take this, just get it all around. I want enough butter, one, because this is going to be how it doesn't stick, although it steak won't stick anyway. Or rather, if it's sticking, it means it's not done yet. But then I'm going to add just some small, a little additional things. Here I have some garlic. This isn't necessarily going on the steak per se, so that's why I'm gonna, it's gonna look like I'm putting a lot on, but it's gonna be part of basting it. Let me actually put some butter in here. Some more. Just so I can start forming like this little pool. I also have the rest of my rosemary. I'm gonna toss that in there. Obviously, this is still a branch. This isn't for eating, it's just for the aromatics. So I'm just going to go make sure I got plenty of this. So I can just make sure, yeah. Gonna tilt. And what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be cooking the steak in the center pocket while I'm searing it, and I'm going to be using a spoon to constantly baste it. And I'm going to explain this all because it's going to go fairly quickly. Essentially, I am going to cook each side, usually if I go up for a very high heat, like I normally do at home, you can cook it for as little as 30 seconds on each side, but I'm gonna basically go side A, flip it, side B, and then I'm gonna make a point to get the edges, like to actually sear the outside edges. It's not as big of a deal with a T-bone, because obviously you have the giant bone there, but if you add like a New York strip, you definitely wanna make sure you get the sides. So I have this, I'm gonna go ahead and show that. I'm going to pick off my rosemary. Again, at this point, it's done. It's a little weird to see because it looks almost like wet because it's still really juicy, but that's actually kind of what we want. So this is going to go right on. I'm going to make sure I don't leak any more uh, rosemary, but I'm going to actually just dump this on more for like a little pan sauce basting. Discard that and I'm going to just tilt get the sauce and then just do my best to, to baste it. Like so. I don't cook a lot of T-bones, so it's kind of interesting seeing the difference having the bone in there just takes. Like just how you grab it, it's on one hand really easier because you have a nice little thing to like actually grab onto, but also you have to like work your way around it. It's just something I like, would never have thought of until I actually did it. You can see like, I'm getting this nice black char. That's personally what I'm looking for. I'm going to go ahead and put that back down. Again, baste it. This is why I actually put like, so much butter in, is just so I can make sure I have a little pool. 
it's like kind of a balancing act between like I want to have enough that I can base it on, but I also want high heat, right? And the butter itself is going to be kind of cooking up this whole time it's doing that. So I just thought trying to find a nice balance and all that. Yeah, again, you see it's really like char. It's going fairly light. Making a point. I'm going to place it on its side. Just use this to kind of mop up a little bit more of our butter. At this point, I would usually not be, I'd be pretty shameless and just be like, you know what? I bought a T-bone. I went to all this trouble. I'm going to, I'm going to use all the butter I need. Yeah. At this point, it's done, so there's no real need for, like, I don't need to, like, leave this on for, like, 10 minutes or something. It's just whatever I think this char is good. I actually think it's going to be good there. Good there. So I'm going to go ahead and transfer this to our plate. This right here. Again, there's no need to rest this, but I usually do. It just makes it, like, it gives you time to do other stuff, and you, it looks nice, good presenting there, and that way it's a, more than anything, resting is a good way to have an excuse to say, like, officially, no one touched this. <laughs> like, even though everything else is, like, still, like, this is done, everything else is still cooking, so, like, officially, just don't touch it. And uh, here's the reason why, but. Next, we're going to go to our potatoes and see how those are going up. You can see in here how the cheese has begun to melt. I'm actually going to switch it to broil. And all that does is, if you're not familiar with broiling, it's a different way to apply the heat. Basically. The whole idea of baking, right, is you're going to raise the temperature of the air in here to a certain amount, and that's how it's going to cook, is just by the air being everywhere. Whereas with broil, what it usually does is it's going to have a broiler on top. It usually it looks like, kind of like a series of metal fins, almost like the opposite of a heat sink. And it's just going to cook it via infrared radiation. So it, it actually is possible to have the doors of your oven open while you do that, just to help watch, because if the air gets out, that's not an issue because you're not baking it. The only thing to watch out for then is because it's usually really high temperatures, it's going to cook way quicker. That's why I try to like say, you know what, get it in, do about half the time where I'm just baking it, and then as it gets to be where it's the last thing cooking, then turn on the broiler, just watch it specifically, say like, okay, give it like a minute, watch, see how it is. Go in, rotate it, because that's one thing is since it's going to cook so fast and it's so like drastic, any little difference, like, okay, is it all the way back in the edge of the oven, is like a little bit of potato, like way closer, that's going to be just magnified when it comes to like how fast they're going to cook. So I know I had times where I would put in like say french fries and broil them, or like do potatoes like this, and you would just have one potato on another potato. And the bottom one would be like fine, but just that one inch for the top potato, will, it'll be burnt before the other ones are like even touched, just because like that inch of difference matters so much more with broiling. I'm just going to take a look and fish one of these out. I try not to use too much oil when I make these, so you won't see them turn like a very deep brown. But generally, it's whenever you think they're ready. So I'm going to actually go ahead and pull these out because, again, they're already done. My steak's done. The extra minute isn't to get like that perfect brown isn't necessary. So why not just serve it alongside with my steak now that that's ready? I also say, if you're going to use a broiler, uh, be aware that it's there. Like it's a separate device. I have a, uh, one pair of oven mitts that I forgot about that and I just glanced the top. Luckily for me, I didn't actually burn myself, but it basically just dissolved when it touched that because it was so hot. But we're going to just go dish up some of these potatoes alongside our steak. Again, at this point, I would also have some nice green alongside there, because I like veggies. Like, to me, again, asparagus or Brussels sprouts would be perfect with this, just to give it some nice color. Maybe something like red, I think, would also be good. If I had to pick something, probably a, a stuffed bell pepper would be a really nice side thing on this. Cool. And I'm just going to just garnet with a little bit of rosemary. Again, this isn't for eating, but again, just a little bit of green and usually all of some leftover. So why not? And it helps. 
I'm sure if like your people are wondering like what you put in it, it kind of frames that like, oh, that's what I did. So here we have our sous vide steak with our tossed potatoes, and that's it. It's a really nice meal. I really like it. It's actually where it's surprisingly simple to put together. This might seem like a lot of pageantry to have all this, but so much of this can done, be done the, not like the night before, t like 10, 20 minutes before you start cooking anything else. So you just kind of have to show up, get it ready, go, and it's just a nice meal. I would make a point though also to serve this with salt and pepper. Sometimes I'll have the potatoes all purposely under season just a little bit because like that way if someone loves salt they can just go to town however they want. So, but if they love pepper or don't like pepper, you can just leave that out. But it looks good. I think I'm definitely going to be uh, cooking way more T-bones in the future at this point because I was surprised. Like I went to an actual butcher shop, got some good recommendations and it came out really, really nice honestly and it's I'm glad that I can make a T-bone because they have a certain amount of prestige to it with like, everyone knows what T-bone is. I don't know if everyone knows what all the other cuts are, but this, this just looks impressive. So again, I'm Grant. This has been Second Plate. Uh, thanks for watching. And hopefully we can uh, find a good use for these potatoes and maybe some leftover steak on the next episode.